Hi, my name's Dan, and in this video, I'm going to go over the changes for the Bookstack May 2024 release. Now, there are quite a few upgrade notices for this release, so I advise you to read those in our blog post, but I will be touching on quite a few of these as we go through the changes. And I apologize in advance for this one. There's not much to visually see. There's a lot of back end and option changes, but hopefully there'll still be something of interest to you. So first up is an upgrade to the framework that we use. So Bookstack is heavily built upon the Laravel framework, and this release takes us up to Laravel 10 from 9. And we perform this update every so often as needed, just to make sure that we're still in the support window of the framework that we're using and of all the dependencies below that. But one change that this does require is an update to the minimum version of PHP that we support. So before Bookstack supported PHP 8.0.2 and higher, but now that's bumped up to PHP 8.1. And if you need help identifying the version of PHP that you're using with some potential instructions on how to update your version of PHP, you can go to this new page in our documentation, which is linked to from our blog post. And this has a little bit of guidance how you can update to the latest version of PHP to meet minimum requirements. If you've installed via one of our official Ubuntu installation scripts, it's likely you won't need to run this just because you should already be running on a supported version of a PHP or you've already had to update beyond what our minimum version required is, but the information is still there should you need it. Next up is an option to define a PDF export command. So within Bookstack we have the default PDF export renderer, which is PHP based so it doesn't need anything external to work, and that does a fair job in a lot of standard cases, but it's not totally accurate in terms of rendering PDF from the Bookstack content. So previously we were provided a WKHTML to PDF option, which is a little bit more accurate and generally has wider default support for things like different languages. But unfortunately, the WK HTML to PDF project is no longer fully supported, at least across all modern systems, and it's dropping out the support of some operating system repositories, for example. So the new PDF export command that we're adding is really intended to replace that. So we're now considering that WK HTML to PDF option deprecated within the book stack. It's still supported for now, but over time, we really intend for this to be the replacement, this export PDF command option. And this allows you to configure a command that will convert book stack provided HTML to an output PDF for exporting. And this is defined as a generic command so you can call any external script or other external program. So it achieves much the same thing, but it's much more flexible in terms of what programs and scripts you can use around creating PDF content for Bookstack. And if you wanted to know more about this, it's worth reading through our documentation. There's a few considerations to think about, especially in terms of security. And we do have one example for this at the moment, this wheezy print command export or option. Although currently this specific example, we are putting a warning there to say this is unsafe because of the way that this command via this program could access the network and file system of the host system. But this is just the initial implementation. What I'd like to do over the next maybe year or so is to build up some extra examples here with some safer ones by default. And perhaps we might build solutions that integrate with Bookstack well in a secure manner and then document them on this page. So next up is a minor change to page content and specifically links. So previously, links were not underlined by default and now they are. So it's quite a simple change but I'm just advising now because it is effectively a change to your core page content and it could have an impact if you're using a lot of links within your content and this is solely done to make links a bit more accessible because before it was only based on color which could be quite hard to read depending on eyesight and the colors configured in your instance but now the underline is there just as an extra indicator that something is a link within the content and if you really don't like this change you can go to our blog post for this update and we have a little snippet that you can add to your custom HTML head content customization setting and this will revert the links back to how they displayed before without the underline. And now onto an update for how OpenID Connect authentication works in Bookstack. So previously in Bookstack, when a user logged in, we supported the first three core steps here of the process up until the point that the authentication system would provide the user details back in a ID token. And in most cases, this worked absolutely fine because all the details required would be part of that token. But in some cases on some authentication platforms, not all details will be provided within that token, which caused a little trouble for some users. So now as of this release, we've also added support for the user info endpoint, which is an additional optional call that a platform like Bookstack can make to get details from the authentication platform. And 
and looking at our OADC documentation, you can see the new option is defined via this OADC user info endpoint option in your end file. Although this is something that can also be auto loaded in by auto discovery. And I should note this will only be used if not all expected details come back on the ID token to save that extra request up to the authentication platform and to save time. And a thanks to Luke here for helping kickstart the implementation of this addition. Now for an update to the API for Bookstack. So in this release, we have a new endpoint, which is for the audit log. So you can now use the API to look up and list out the activities in the much the same way that you'd see within the audit log within the settings area of Bookstack as an administrator. And in the same way, this audit log endpoint would require the API user to have the same permissions, which is permission to both manage users and to manage system settings. But this now provides provides you that ability to get those details out via an automated way so then you can integrate these details or export them to other platforms and whatever you want to do really. And then for instances that have open sign up forms, we all know that spam can be a problem on the internet, especially spam sent via forms like this one. So this release adds a very simple hidden honeypot field to the sign up form just as a minor point of defense against the simplest of spam bots. Uh, thanks to Thomas here for contributing this feature. And now jumping back to authentication, there's been an update for LDAP authentication. It's now possible to define a custom path to a certificate or folder of certificates to use as certificate authority certificates for LDAP TLS connections. And that option can be seen in our documentation as seen here. And then one other minor little change for LDAP is that the LDAP user filter now supports the placeholder as curly braces user without the dollar. And this is just us trying to standardize on how we use placeholders in options like these. And this change shouldn't have any effect on existing use cases unless you just so happen to have a legitimate case of curly braces user within your user filter, which I imagine should be very, very rare. A uh, thank you to Matt here who helped kickstart the implementation of adding the certificate handling to Bookstack. And now moving on to a new page we've added to Bookstack and that is the licenses page. So this can be accessed via going to settings and then under the system version, there's license details, which you can click through on or you can just go straight to the URL. And this is a page that's just dedicated to listing out the licenses of Bookstack itself and all the projects and dependencies used to build Bookstack, both production and development dependencies. So this was done just to standardize how we provide license information and making that a bit more visible. This is all about just centralizing and standardizing this information for easier access. And once again, a massive thank you to everyone that's helped translate Bookstack into various other languages since our last release. Big thanks to all the names listed here. Now on to next steps. So within Bookstack, the core default WYSIWYG page editor and also the editor that we now use for comments and descriptions is from the Tiny MCE project. And specifically, we're currently using Tiny MCE 6 and that is licensed under the MIT license, which is the same license that Bookstack uses. As of Tiny MCE 7, they've now moved to the GPL v2 plus, which as far as I'm concerned for a major part of the project that we rely upon, is not compatible with the licensing of Bookstack. And there's various options of how we handle this. For example, we could change to a compatible license ourselves, but personally for me, there are reasons why I chose the MIT license. I'm very much appreciate this simplicity and freedom to the user that's using the software. And while I do massively respect the GPL licenses and how they better focus on the freedoms of the code to potential users, they are a longer, more complex license. And I'm not too keen on changing our whole licensing viewpoint and philosophy based off of one dependency changing their license, especially in this case, because Tiny MCE have made a few changes over time. There used to be LGPL license, which was compatible. So this is the third license that we've seen them use. And they've also done other things like um, move features around to paid offerings and things like that. So even if we did tr change our license, I'm not sure exactly where that project is going but at the end of the day we have benefited greatly from their work so that's a, you know it's a positive overall i don't think there's any reason necessarily to get angry at a company for doing what they feel they need to do even if it doesn't align with our goals and what we would want but that does leave us in a position of thinking about options so i did open a discussion about this on the bookstack project 
But really, the, this next release cycle is probably going to be a case of diving deeper into this to spend the time to properly assess the options because it's going to have probably long term implications. And those options are currently looking along the lines of maintaining a custom simpler fork that we can then focus on books there, or we could potentially help maintain a wider community fork of the old project, or we could look again at what alternatives are out there. So it would just be a case of spending the time to, to better understand the implications of those options. And then something else not directly related to the core code base is that we recently added the Ubuntu 24.04 installation script to the website as we normally do for the Ubuntu LTS releases. So I'd like to spend some time creating a new video as I've done for the last couple of Ubuntu releases that dives in how to use this script and how to do common things like adding HTTPS and maybe go further this time to provide a little bit of guidance for maintenance as well. But that's everything I've got covered in this release. I'm sorry, again, there was nothing flashy, big new features or anything to really visually see. This was very much a maintenance backend updating release. But upon what I've showed, there was also many other little tweaks, improvements and bug fixes as well. So hopefully once upgraded, you do find a nicer overall experience. By the way, I hope your upgrade goes well and have a wonderful day.